Okay, we can begin. Hello and welcome to Proba 3's Press Day from Redwire, Belgium. I'm Terry Riley. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for Redwire Space. And I will be your moderator for today's news conference. Art Pietz, ESA's Director of Technology. Thank you all for being here today. To begin, I'd like to introduce you to Redwire's Chairman and CEO, Pete Canito, to welcome our guest. Thank you. That was a pretty incredible video, right? And uh, well done with the accents, too. Yeah? <laughs> Got the right person for the job. Good afternoon, everyone. As Terry mentioned, my name is Peter Canito. I'm the chairman and CEO of Redwire. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's event. It's an honor to host ESA and the Proba 3 team here at Redwire. There are industrial participants from over 14 countries involved in this mission, with Spain and Belgium leading the way. The Proba platform has remarkable heritage and an incredible history of success, starting in 2001 with Proba 1, then Proba 2, Proba V, and now Proba 3. Proba 3 continues the legacy of innovations and groundbreaking successes for new science and technology. Specifically, as you will soon hear about in greater detail, Proba 3 will be groundbreaking in two extraordinary ways. One, for engineering, and the other, for science. First, from a scientific perspective, Proba will be creating an artificial eclipse in space which will provide an unprecedented understanding of the sun's corona to include solar flares and space weather. This is critical as the phenomena has a significant impact on the performance of satellites orbiting the Earth, our communications networks, and even our power grid here on Earth. Second, from an engineering perspective, this is a first of its kind demonstration of satellite formation flying, where two satellites will be collaborative, collaboratively working together with precision accuracy a complex and extraordinary demonstration of engineering excellence. The lessons learned from Proba 3 will inform future missions of collaborative satellites working together in innovative ways to expand our understanding of space. I would like to thank the entire Proba 3 team, all our partners for their hard work, dedication, and commitment to excellence as they execute this very important program. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I've been practicing my accents for the past three days, so thank you. <laughs> All right, over the uh, course of the next hour, we will be providing a comprehensive update on Proba 3 mission. 
With us here today are senior leadership and mission experts from ESA, Sener, Redwire Space, and the Royal Observatory of Belgium. I'd like to first to call on ESA's Director of Technology, Dietmar Pilz, Pilz, excuse me, to introduce you to Proba 3. All right, thank you. Thank you, Thierry. So maybe, um, first of all, if I would have known how many people and how many important people are waiting here, I would have probably even uh, ignored more of the speed limits that I already did. So I'm sorry for, for being a minute, a minute or two late. Uh, um, and i um, really, really happy to be here and um, at this uh, press conference here um, and uh, with you and uh, saying a couple of words. Um, maybe in just a few days, um, a total eclipse, um, as we have heard of, uh, before, of the sun will take place, visible from the US, parts of Canada, uh, Mexico. And like all the eclipses, when the moon uh, blocks the sun as seen from Earth, this will be an excellent opportunity for many, many researchers all over the planet to look at the sun and particular look at the corona of the sun, as we can see it on, on the slide here. It shows uh, um, uh, the, the, the eruptions, it shows the solar activity, um, which is important uh, for many of, of, our, um, of our technical, but also for our research um, institutes. Um, it's a very active focus of research, uh, um, a major influence of the space environment um, between our star and Earth, and is the cause of what we will call, or what we are calling, space weather, which can affect satellites in orbit, um, and um, as well as power and communications of our satellites down here, or our networks down here on the ground as a result of the impact to the satellites. Um, I'm mentioning this eclipse as a total solar eclipse, uh, um, so it really is blocking the entire sun. And this has inspired um, our Proba 3 mission, a project of ESA's generally, uh, um, general technology program, GSTP, and in particular its fly component, which is um, aimed at proving new technologies in orbit. Proba 3 will be the first mission to demonstrate what we call um, precise formation flying, meaning a mission where a pair of satellites fly together in a coordinated way. The distance between the satellites is controlled, the satellite orientation is controlled, and all of this will be done, of course, in an autonomous manner. This will create an effect in effect, a virtual science instrument of a diameter of 150 meters. Um, the two satellites will act as if they would be one, as if they would be one um, enormous um, instrument. This 150 meter long instrument will be a coronagraph, which mimics at a smaller scale a total solar eclipse, one satellite will block all the sunlight, and the other will observe the corona from within the shadow being cast by the first satellite. If it works as expected, and I'm really, really um, hoping and I'm really sure that it will work as expected, um, it, will, um, it will deliver science's eclipses, basically um, not only as the opportunity is arising right now, but more or less on demand um, with very high precision and new possibilities to observe um, the solar eclipse. It's an extremely technically challenging experiment, a tiny bit of misalignment between the two satellites will not allow the, um, the precision flying and it will not allow therefore the, uh, to, for the instrument to work. Um, and uh, therefore, it has, to, it has to work with an unprecedented um, accuracy, 
um, of the flying, of the formation flying of the two satellites. PROMA 3 will demonstrate special technologies necessary to perform formation flying, accurate sensors to measure distance as one, and alignments. Not only it has to have the right distance, but of course it needs exactly um, in the line between sun or the, the, the shadow giving satellite needs to be exactly in line between the sun and the measurement uh, satellite. It will demonstrate various types of formation flying um, configurations and it will experiment with in-orbit rendezvous techniques. Once proven, formation flying will be an enabler for future missions, allowing formations of space telescopes uh, scopes to observe cosmic targets jointly and potentially achieving imaging resolutions equivalent to one large giant telescope while showcasing some capabilities useful for an in-orbit servicing and the removal of derelict satellites from orbit. Developed under uh, ESA's GSTP program, PROBA 3 has involved more than, as we heard before, more than 40 companies from 14 countries some of them producing their first hardware in space. Um, and um, as we also heard, under the lead of Spain and Belgium. The mission development has been long and has required uh, um, lots of effort from the companies, from ESA, from all the participants um, along this um, long journey, um, which now finally comes to Inspet. I'm really pleased to see that PROBA 3 is now entering um, its final steps of the verification and that we can see this fantastic instrument, this fantastic giant instrument in space. Um, and just after the final steps of the verification before we then launch. ESA is supporting technology demonstrations as part of its technical mandate and several missions have and will be flown. Some are CubeSats, some are small missions, and many rely on the so-called new space concepts, making maximum use of novel technologies and commercial off-the-shelf parts. This is a fantastic role for us, for, uh, for ESA, and demonstrates one of the agency's, um, one of the agency's raison, raison d'etre. This type of mission can be delivered by ESA thanks to its in-depth expertise and proven ability to oversee cross-European and Canadian projects, international cooperation is in our DNA. Other challenging projects are in preparation, including CubeSats heading into deep space, very low altitude missions, and many other demonstrating a wealth of technologies and techniques. As we hear today in Redwire, let me also point out that PROBA 3 is the fourth PROBA mission and three previous PROBA missions built by Redwire are already in orbit and still fully operational, adding up to about 50 years of combined in-orbit lifetimes. Congratulations. I will conclude by wishing good luck to the team that I see here and I see many, many faces that I've seen here over the last year that I looked at um, over, um, over the different visits um, of this fantastic uh, um, project, not only in front of me, but also to the left side. So um, wishing you all the best, wishing you good luck. want to thank um, uh, the di different teams, uh, as at the 40 participants, um, the member states uh, that supported, of course, the GSTP program, the team here, and I wish um, all of us and, and, uh, um, and, and the team in particular very good luck. And I'm really looking forward to the launch and for the first results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and now we will hear for uh, what is next for launch of Proba 3 mission and on-orbit commissioning from Diego Rodriguez. Business Development and General Manager for Space and Science at CENER. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Pilf, and, and welcome. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, I'm, I'm here in representation of uh, CENER, 
And our role here is to ensure that uh, the whole show run properly. You said before, good luck, and I and agree, you mm -hmm. always have to have good luck, but first, uh, hard work, and, and this is what we are doing right now, right now here. I will only dedicate just uh, three, four minutes just to uh, make a summary of where we are and what are the next, uh, the next steps. But first of all, what I would like to say is that, to recall that this is a technology demonstration mission. We, we are doing uh, the first of its kind mission. Uh, and it's especially or particularly difficult uh, because of the fact that here we are dealing with two satellites that have, will have to work in perfect synchronization. And that makes all the development uh, program, and in particular this verification test uh, plan, very difficult. There is a lot of people uh, involved and we have to go over, over uh, every procedure once and over, uh, ensuring that it will work uh, properly. As I said, this is our main role is to ensure that these performances are met. And when I say that uh, is, uh, this is a technology demonstration, there are uh, new equipments here, which uh, the metrology system in particular, that will provide us the performances that we expect from, from these uh, satellites that need to be uh, tested. We will have to do many maneuvers. And one of the objectives of the mission is to prove the technology for the future, all these opportunities that uh, Formation Fry will, will bring. The other one, we have the perfect test case for the formation flying, uh, the coronagraph. It's, it's a very good example of what can be achieved with, with the technology. So we are combining here this technology demonstration with a specific payload that uh, only if the system works with the precision that is required, we will obtain the corona information that we are searching, we are looking, we are looking for. And to achieve that, we have uh, combined the uh, skills of many companies, and in particular, there is a strong uh, core team made of companies coming from Spain and, and Belgium. Uh, we have, at this point right now, in the functional testing, and, uh, but we come from a, a large environmental uh, testing campaign that was led by Airbus, Spain, and that was uh, uh, made at IABG in, in Germany. And was, well, I must say, that the results are very, uh, very good. But now we are uh, involved totally in the functional testing of the hardware of the satellite. Uh, my uh, here, he will explain later in more detail what we are doing. But apart from the job at Redwire, it's very important the production in parallel, the uh, tuning of all the software, uh, which has two main elements on one side, the formation flying in, in, the, in the satellites, but also in ground, the fly dynamics, which is led by GMB. Uh, very important, as you can imagine, for this mission. And then all that software is collected under the responsibility of Space Bell. Uh, and then, as I said, our role here is then also verify, uh, to, to review the, 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 all the, the test performances that we achieve and, and to be sure that we will go to the launching base in good conditions. All that happened, we finished that part of the campaign by uh, end of July, and then we moved to the uh, launching base. You know that uh, a PCLV launcher will take this uh, Prova stack. What we will do once we arrive there, uh, there is make some functional test, uh, short functional test to ensure that the hardware is, is okay. And then we prepare the stack. We put one of the satellites on top of the other, and then it is moved to the uh, to the launcher. The launch is uh, expected to be in uh, September, but then we uh, uh, and then we need good luck again. But uh, it's not the end of the story. Before we can do science, we still have a lot of things to do, and uh, uh, the commission is also going to be a relatively long uh, uh, process, where the well the first the, the first the satellite the two satellites separate from the launcher. The first thing we, we do is uh, deploy the solar panels. Then we make a functional test to check that the units are working properly, and we separate. And then start the show to control the two units separately. But as I said before, the operations uh, uh, have to ensure that they are properly synchronized. And then uh, we check the ENC, we check the metrology, 
until only then we'll be prepared to start the, the doing science and starting to check the coronagraph. We are, of course, now running in the first quarter of 2025, maybe even, even more. As you see, a complex mission, and uh, we need luck, but still we have a lot of hard work to do before we are in that, in that moment. In any case, uh, we are all confident that the mission will be a, a, perfect, a good success. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now to give you the latest on the satellite testing milestones as it prepares for launch is Frank de, uh, Pidum, uh from Redwire Space, Business Development and Sales Director. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, I'm uh, honored to, to speak on, on behalf of the entire Proba team uh, that you see present here and have um, uh, given you the explanations uh, before in the, in the clean room. So we started uh, the big, big work here uh, in our clean room about uh, two years ago now. I was honestly a bit surprised it was already uh, so long. Uh, but then at that time we received the satellite structures which were produced by, uh, by Airbus and we started uh, integrating the, the satellites. So we had already a number of subunits uh, available that we uh, test then separately and the others uh, came in then uh, on later uh, moments, and uh, then all the units are then subsequ subsequently uh, integrated into the into the spacecraft, and uh, to make sure that everything is working uh, working well together. Then, as Diego already mentioned, uh, last year we went uh, when everything was fully integrated into the environmental uh, test uh, campaign. In uh, Munich, um, you see the satellites there in stacked configuration because that's the launch uh, configuration, and so that's the configuration they will see uh, the highest uh, highest loads. And then after the environmental test uh, campaign, uh, everything uh, came back uh, to our facilities. Obviously, when everything comes back, we had to, to check if everything was still uh, functioning well after these um, uh, big uh, stresses which are, are put on the spacecrafts. But then we gradually could uh, start uh, the real uh, functional testing uh, with uh, the software that we uh, received from our other partners. Um, and we really could start um, yeah, the uh, functional uh, testing of uh, the separate uh, separate satellites. Um, so we have been doing lots of testing already on the GNC uh, functions. Um, so as already mentioned, uh, we have a number of metrologies to, to make sure that we can uh, be aligned uh, when uh, when in orbit. Um, and these are RF and optical systems. So we have to make sure that they, they work uh, uh, together. Um, this takes some time because, of course, we don't uh, only need to test, uh, let's say, nominal cases. Uh, the software also foresees uh, failure detection uh, and isolation, it's called, uh, which means that we simulate uh, failures and uh, we have to make sure that uh, in case of failures that uh, at least uh, we are in a safe case, but also that we can recover from, uh, from those failures. So that's one of the reasons that it, uh, it takes, uh, takes a long time, uh, because all these simulations, of course, um, they don't always go well from the, from the first time. In, the, in parallel, uh, we will also uh, start um, next, no, this month, uh, basically. Uh, we will start uh, training uh, the operators, uh, because currently we are kind of operating the, the satellites, of course, but once the satellites are in, are in orbit, it's the intention that uh, the people in Redu uh, will operate uh, the satellites and they will have to be uh, trained and we will have to agree together with them how exactly we are going to work together, uh, especially the first couple of months during the commissioning phase. And in next month also, so we will start the final um, system uh, validation testing. Um, and these are tests where we really simulate real operational scenarios. So the, the first system validation, validation test will look to kind of nominal uh, orbits, uh, which is the elliptical orbits. Uh, the second one will look into 
let's uh, uh, yeah, specific uh, operations like the launch and uh, early operational uh, phases. And then gradually we go on uh, and on to more complex uh, simulation scenarios and the last uh, and final uh, simulation, uh, system validation tests will involve all the partners and all the operation centers. So the people in um, the Royal Observatory will issue um, a task uh, uh, and that goes to Redu, who will simulate the uploading to the, uh, to the spacecraft. Well, actually it will come then uh, to, to here. Uh, we will execute it uh, on the satellites and then when data is gathered, it will go back uh, to Redu to the ground station who will deliver it then finally to uh, the science uh, team. So that will do a real uh, simulation of what we will need to do later uh, once the satellites uh, are launched. Um, and as uh, I said, so once the satellites are, are launched, our tasks are are not finished, uh, so during the commission, commissioning phase, our team will uh, be in charge of the operation. So we will ship the satellites at a certain moment to, to India, uh, yes, but uh, most of the team, they will uh, travel to Redu, unfortunately. <laughs> it's a bit less exotic, uh, but uh, there is where the real uh, stuff is, uh, will be going on and uh, will be uh, operating the satellites uh, during the first uh, moments uh, they are in orbit and hopefully to demonstrate that uh, everything is, uh, is going well and handing over then after the end of the in-orbit commissioning phase, uh, really handing over the operations to the, to the ESA team uh, and then it's up to them to, to run the normal operations and hopefully uh, start uh, yeah, a, a fruitful uh, mission uh, where we can make uh, everyone, and especially our, our scientists, uh, happy. Thank you, Frank. Uh, speaking of science, uh, next we're going to hear a little bit more about the exciting science that the mission will provide. Uh, from André Zhukov, Principal Investigator for the Royal Observatory of Belgium. So Proba 3 will not have only outstanding technology, but also it will do outstanding science. It will observe solar corona as uh, never before. So what is solar corona? Corona is the outer part of the atmosphere of the sun above its visible surface. When I say, I say visible, but you should never try to look directly on the sun without protection. Really might be dangerous. Uh, so uh, this is the outer part of the solar atmosphere. And um, it consists of uh, plasma heated to a million degrees. That's really hot and some dust. So plasma is a hot gas with uh, atoms fully or partially stripped of uh, electrons. So corona is uh, very hot, yeah? But uh, it's also in a continuous expansion. It's not static. It's always, always expanding because it's so hot and uh, expanding into the interplanetary space. So in a sense, one can say that the Earth is located inside the atmosphere of the star. And uh, it's not just all the time expanding, it is also having some structure inside, and the most prominent structures are so-called coronal mass ejections, which are the large-scale structures propagating in the solar wind. They originate from eruptive processes in the solar atmosphere, so very low in the corona. And why this is important? So when solar wind, and especially coronal mass ejections, may arrive at the Earth, they may trigger uh, the environment, the plasma environment of the Earth. And in turn, that might trigger the disturbances in human technologies, like GPS, the spacecraft functioning, the power transmission. Uh, and uh, not only that, it might also affect the health of astronauts, well, even in the International Space Station, but also those who are intending to go, well, who will go one day, I hope, to the moon and further to Mars. This is what we call space weather. So, but in usual conditions, we cannot really see the corona because uh, the solar disk is like a million times brighter than the corona, so usually corona is uh, too dim to be seen. And uh, the standard natural, let's say, way 
to see the corona is during a total solar eclipse. So during the total solar eclipse, the moon is covering the disk of the sun, and the corona can be visible. So it's just a coincidence that uh, the apparent size of the sun and the moon in the sky, it's uh, very, very similar. So uh, just because the sun is, uh, let's say, uh, 400 times larger than the moon, but also 400 times further away. And um, so uh, the sizes, the apparent sizes are so similar, but this also means that the eclipse, when they're perfectly aligned, uh, the total eclipse is very short, so seven minutes and a half at most. So this is not really uh, satisfactory. And uh, the orbits uh, of the Earth around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth are not lying in the same geometric plane. So these eclipses are not happening very often. So uh, once per year on average. So uh, this is what we want to do with uh, Proba 3, to have the second spacecraft occulting the Sun for the telescope located on the first spacecraft. And so to have six hours long total eclipses, and much more frequently than in natural ways, let's say twice per week. So essentially, we want to have eclipses on demand. So the science uh, that uh, Proba 3 will be doing is intimately linked uh, to its ability to observe the region of the inner corona, which is, let's say, poorly observed by the current instrumentation. So the movie which is shown here, showing the uh, EUV image of the sun in the center and the coronagraph, uh, the, the red one, the outer image. So, and you see this dark part where the observations are really difficult. We are not satisfied with observations which we already have, but the solar wind and coronal mass ejections originate exactly in this region which is difficult to observe. So uh, Proba 3 will image this region in eclipse-like conditions and uh, address a few outstanding problems in solar physics. First is the structure of the solar corona. We are still not uh, fully sure why corona is structured like this. It's clear magnetic field has to do something with that, but uh, it's really difficult uh, to predict it. Now there are teams which are predicting uh, the coronal appearance during the upcoming total solar eclipse. We will see how their prediction will uh, fare out. Uh, the second science objective is the origin of solar wind. As I said, solar wind is uh, not stationary and not homogeneous, and actually this part is originating exactly in this region, which is uh, black in this picture. And uh, one more science question is the physics of coronal mass ejections, which are appearing again inside this region, and uh, they are developing and accelerating right there, and we do not observe this well enough to make conclusions about their physics. So Proba 3 will really become a reference for future observations of the solar corona. And uh, I should say big thank you to the engineering team present here and those who are not present here. We are really looking forward for this mission to be launched. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll be taking questions uh, from the media in the room first, and then questions from media who are joining us remotely online. Uh, for, for those in the room, please raise your hand if you have a question, state your affiliation, and whom you're directing your question to, and we'll begin opening up now for the floor. Any questions? Yes, right over here. He's going to pass you a microphone. Thank you. My name is Christian Dubrul. I'm working for dailyscience.be and today also for newspaper L'Echo. I have a question regarding the budget of the mission. Can you give us some figures and who is paying what, actually? Thanks. Thank you. Who would like to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess we can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the the rough um, uh, maximum or the maximum rough budget is about uh, 200 uh, million um, in in order of magnitude. Um, this is distributed over the the participating states. Um, we just discussed 14 different nations. So they 
they participate uh, um, in this in this program uh, very significantly, as we also stated already, from Belgium and from Spain, um, and uh, um, and therefore distribute. I don't know the exact uh, uh, figures here, but these are the major contributors, and then the other states as well. This is, by the way, this is a standard uh, form for for ESA, in particular also for the general uh, program that we have for the GSTP program where the different uh, states um, sign up into, into such a program according to their interest and according also to their industry, how they can participate and, um, and they, how they want. And this is how it's done here as well. Uh, I really have to look at my team. Yeah, of course. But um, in, in the portion, how much is Spain and Belgium about in percentage? We could also get back to you right after um, and give you a better, a better um, specific answer if that, if that is uh, helpful. Okay. Yes, one more question over here. Uh, my name is Christophe Gordon. I'm from Centre Spatial de Liège. Uh, you mentioned Proba 1, Proba 2, Proba V, now Proba 3. Uh, will it be a Proba 4, 5, 6? What's the future program for this kind of technology development? Hmm. Sorry, me again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yes, uh, there will be. Uh, um, so, so in general, we have the so-called in-orbit demonstration, in-orbit verification programs um, within the GSTP fly element um, of, of ESA. Um, which is, uh, um, as you pointed out, uh, very successful over the past. And of course, we will continue. In which way we will continue, which are the next missions that's to be seen. Um, uh, but uh, we will continue with the IOD, IOV program. Question over here. Uh, yes, my name is Remco Timmermans. Uh, I represent uh, SpaceSide. Um, I have a question about something that was mentioned in kind of the sidelines, but referring to two very important topics in the space sector at the moment. One is debris mitigation. So um, deorbiting the mission as soon as the mission is over. The other one is in orbit servicing. I heard that term a few times. How do these two elements fit in this particular mission? Maybe I can, I can answer uh, on that. Well, um, one of the tests we are doing is also related to rendezvous. The rendezvous there is a specific uh, 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 test we will do in rendezvous, but in general, what we are bringing here is uh, uh, the ability to do uh, complex, but at the same time, very precise maneuvers. Okay, This is what it uh, is, uh, is bringing to us. So uh, probably it's in the area of rendezvous where this uh, technology uh, has direct, uh, direct use. Uh, normally, the formation flying uh, capabilities uh, bring uh, another market or, or another capacity in the area of being able to deploy large systems that normally will be made uh, with uh, solid structures. But now you avoid them because you are working in a, in a manner which is similar to a, a virtual structure because the rigidity you are getting is similar to the one you will get with, with LAR. And the reason is, is obvious. There is a limit on what you can put in the launcher. It, that, is, that is obvious. So I would say that these are the two areas where we benefit from uh, the technologies we are getting. One is the possibility to do uh, complex uh, and at the same time precise maneuvers, and the other one is the possibility to have virtual structures uh, where you, you will have several elements. We will have to go in synchronous, uh, very synchronous, uh, in, in perfect formation, but without having physical elements joining them. And, and that has applications, obviously, typically in science, but not only. Does that answer both of your questions? What's the end of mission plan? The mission is slated for two years, I believe, give or take. What's the end of mission plan? How can we avoid this thing to stay in space for too long? Uh, the duration is less than that, no? Uh, 
after five years or two years of operational lifetime, but after five years, the two spacecraft will uh, re-enter naturally into the atmosphere and, and burn into the atmosphere. Yeah. So we don't leave any space junk in, into the orbit. We are uh, cleaning the orbit. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, any other questions in the room? One more in the back. Hi, uh, David Stock from New Scientist in London. Um, science question to um, Andre. Um, the, you talked about this mission looking at the, the structure of the solar corona, the origin of solar wind, the physics of CMEs. Will this mission alone further that science significantly? Will it answer those questions? Or is this just the start of more missions required to answer those questions? And then just to follow up, um, how, will, how will that knowledge help mitigate some of the issues by solar wind and CMEs might cause on, on Earth at, at present? Okay, so the, um, the first question, um, 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 we are not going to solve all the problems in solar physics, of course. <laughs> And it's, uh, I will not even say that um, this is uh, maybe opening it, but let's say it's another piece of a puzzle which is needed to solve these questions. Like what I showed uh, in this movie, we do, we do have a gap where observations are really poor. We do want to have better observations there. So uh, I really like to think about it like a new piece in a puzzle. So the second question about the mitigation, uh, well, okay, but still maybe I will add that, uh, yes, still this technology is paving the way for future missions which might use the same technology, but maybe for some other purpose. Well, uh, I know there were concepts of uh, uh, solar observations in hard X-rays, for example, done with the formation flying, or uh, very fine, uh, very high resolution observations of the corona in extreme ultraviolet, also involving formation flying. So once the technology is there, there are new horizons opening, that's clear. And about the mitigation, um, okay, we are not observing the corona all the time, so we cannot be really a monitor of uh, solar activity, of solar weather, but we hope to provide to improve our scientific understanding, which would allow us one day to predict uh, solar weather, space weather better. And Terry, I, I might just add that uh, in the room with us is Alexi Glover. She's one of the scientists working in our space safety program, and she can certainly give you a, a bit more background on how this type of data uh, can be used to improve modeling and improve predictions and, and all that sort of thing. So yeah, she's just sitting right there. Perfect. Uh, so actually, I'll take that uh, to transition into questions uh, from media who are joining us remotely. Uh, those questions will be read by uh, Daniel Suka from ESA Communications. Thanks, Terry. Okay, uh, we didn't get a lot of questions uh, so far, but there is one that came up. And uh, I, I wasn't sure if this was uh, uh, cheeky, but actually it's, it's not a bad question. <laughs> it says, why not just extend a disk from a boom, a long boom, instead of flying to spacecraft. I, I don't know who would. Why don't? Oh, I didn't get that. Who I has? Why, why, why not? Uh, why, why, yeah, yeah. why not simply have the disc on a, on a long boom from the spacecraft? A selfie. Uh, a selfie. A selfie. I believe that 150 meters boom, <laughs> that would be uh, not easy to do. I will not say impossible, but... Uh, I think that that would be really hard, harder than to do the formation flying. Yes. Sounds like but, a future engineer. Well, and I, I think add, adding to, to that answer, of, of course, that has also challenges. But obviously, as already indicated by, by Diego, doing the formation flying not only solves the solar eclipse, but can also help technology for other missions, uh, which you wouldn't solve with the, with the boom, of course. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can also comment. That's exactly the point. So there's 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 uh, two two um, mission targets, as we pointed out. There's one about the um, uh, the corona graph. That's one thing, um, which um, which with uh, with two um, objects that can actually move to each other also gives uh, different possibilities in in terms of where you want to exactly. 
um, look at the corona and, and what you really want to block out. Uh, that, that's one thing. Um, but the second one is, is, as I pointed out, is it's actually an IOD, IOV mission. So it, it shows, it demonstrates, it brings us one step forward in terms of formation flying. And, and that is the, the other uh, part um, of, of the mission, maybe the even more important part, to show that we can do such an, uh, such an incredibly precise formation flying, which we will use for other missions in the future as well. Let me maybe uh, only to add. We are talking about two uh, satellites separated, 100, in that order of magnitude, maybe 115, and trying to maintain them within the centers of gravity within some millimeters. And at the same time, the precision of pointing is arc seconds. To do that with the balloon, I mean, find it quite, quite uh, difficult. Uh, just to give you an insight of the level of precision we, we need to acquire here. And, uh, uh, I mean, that definitely opens a lot of new opportunities, for, especially for science. A little add-on question. Maybe playing the less informed audience that we're dealing with in society. Sure. Why not put this spacecraft on a 150 meter long boom right here on Earth, instead of spending 200 million of bringing this thing into space? Well, it's a bit, a bit of devil's advocate, but, but explain that to me. At the Earth, uh, the problem is the atmosphere. So uh, the atmosphere, the light from the solar disk is getting scattered in the atmosphere. So you just get a kind of uniform background. So the things like this, they do exist. They are called uh, ground-based coronagraphs. Usually they are put high in the mountains, like in Hawaii. There is one. But uh, the quality is uncomparable uh, to space coronagraphs. It's just the atmosphere which uh, destroys everything. Okay, great. There's, uh, there's another question coming in from uh, Andrew Jones, who is a journalist working for IEEE Spectrum, which is a U.S. Uh, a US uh, technology publication. His question is, what are the key technological advancements enabling the Proba 3 mission, and how do you foresee the demonstration of precise satellite formation flying affecting future space missions? And I know, uh, Damien, that's very close to the uh, uh, question you got from the French journalist uh, uh, just, just the other day. So that's a question. Do you want to? So in, in terms of technologies, uh, to, to achieve this mission, probably we had to, to develop uh, new specialized equipment to advance new technologies. I could mention uh, the laser metrology that we are going to use. We are going to also to, to use a visual-based sensor, so a set of uh, cameras and uh, taking image of the other uh, satellite and uh, uh, imaging some optical uh, targets. We are also uh, going to, to, to do in orbit uh, a relative uh, GPS uh, orbit uh, determination. Uh, we will also uh, use a specialized uh, system with uh, 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 what we call the shadow position sensor. So when the coronagraph is in the shadow, there will be some uh, light sensor that will measure the light intensity and that will detect if the coronagraph is slightly off position with respect to the center of, of the shadow. And there are also, in terms of uh, GNC, so guidance, navigation, and control algorithm, a lot of development that has, uh, that has been done. And this is all uh, what we want to, to demonstrate in orbit with an actual application, which is observation of the corona. So it's by achieving very good observation of the corona that we uh, definitely demonstrate the, 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 that all these uh, equipment are working and that the technology is delivering uh, actual science uh, data. Thank you, Damien. Uh, he also asked, uh, how would these technologies affect future space missions? I think we've covered many of them or, uh, or already, but to summarize, uh, was mentioned rendezvous missions, those missions where you need somehow to work with two satellites or two entities where you need very high precision movements relative one each other, and the other one is in general in science when, especially for instruments, where well, you can, uh, in, a, in a very deep way, to enlarge the size, and has been mentioned uh, before, for instance, X-ray is a very good application, and the precisions we are getting here 
are very appropriate for these kind of uh, uh, experiments where you have a ring to collect the X-ray and then on the other side the detector. And with the ability to change, let's say, the focal length, which is an additional thing you will then be able to do with, with classic satellites. Thank you. And Terry, there, there, there's one final one. It's again, it's also from, uh, from Andrew Jones. Yeah. And he says, uh, what are the most significant operational challenges expected during the mission? Well, I can say about the science operations. So the, the challenge is that um, we cannot bring to the Earth all the data which we will collect because, well, telemetry is limited. There is, uh, we scientists, we always want more, more and more data. And um, we will have to do some selection and uh, the technology will allow us to do it. So once we have something interesting in the memory of the spacecraft, but which we did not yet bring it down to the Earth, we have the ability to I don't know, we even stop observations for a while and wait until we download, uh, downlink this interesting data to the Earth. But that requires really evaluation. Is it interesting enough to stop observations for a while or not? So this will be uh, challenging. But we are ready for this challenge. So maybe maybe to add also from an from an uh, from satellite from a space uh, um, uh, um, a spacecraft point of view, um, it, there's two uh, there's two phases. Um, uh, the, the first operational challenging phase, as in any mission, is um, is this the the start the LEOP when we when when you go up and when you assemble for the first time when you get into this formation that's always um, a challenge here in particular since it's two satellites who go into form an air formation. The interesting part here is that we have a very, very elliptical orbit. Um, we're going out to 60,000 um, kilometers above Earth um, at the apogee. And, um, and then when it comes back, we will disassemble the formation. We cannot hold it for the entire uh, time of the flight. So we will have to renew each and every time the, the formation again and again and again. So each time we have a corona before that, we have to, uh, have to bring the two um, satellites again into formation, into the alignment, into the precision of the distance. And that's clearly the operational uh, challenge. And I think that's also the experimental part. We will, uh, we will look at this, uh, not only from a, from a scientific, from a coronagraph uh, point of view, but uh, see um, how far we can get the formation flying, uh, um, what, what are the distance that we can achieve. So and this, is, this needs a lot of uh, operational expertise, software from all the partners um, that are um, in this project. Thank you. Any other questions online? All right. Well, this concludes uh, today's press conference. I'd like to thank our speakers and guests uh, for those of you who have joined us today. In case you miss anything, the live stream of 